everyone, I'm Sandra Hoyle. I'm the president of the Del Mar Foundation. I wanna welcome you to our um, virtual DMF talk, Climate Consequences, the Effects of Global, uh, the, collects of, the Effects of Climate Change Globally and Locally. The DMF Talks is the foundation's unique version of TED Talks. We draw our speakers from the inspiring local base of creative, intelligent, intellectual scientific leaders that are locally. Um, for the past eight years, DMF Talks has aimed to entertain, inspire, inform, and um, all of the Del Mar community through a series of free presentations. We need your support with this virtual presentation. We ask that everyone please keep their microphones muted. We encourage you to turn off your videos to ensure that we have adequate bandwidth. I promise you will still be able to see and hear the presentation if you turn your videos off and you mute yourselves. To best enjoy the talk, we advise you to switch to speaker view rather than gallery view. And you can usually get that on the right hand side of your screen. We request that you stay muted throughout the talk and direct all questions or comments through the chat feature. There will be a short question and answer session following the talk and I'll monitor the chat box and I'll moderate the questions with our speaker. Thank you everyone for your cooperation. So Dagmar Midcap is a media personality and weathercaster originally based in Vancouver, Canada, British Columbia. After graduating from the British Columbia Institute of Technology's broadcast journalism program, she worked at WBNX TV in Akron, Ohio, and in Canada at various television stations. Moving away from live television, she hosted the show Crash Test Mommy and was the co-host for BCTV's driving television in which she test drove new cars on a regular basis, of which I'm super jealous. Motorcycles. It <laughs> oh, that's even cooler. Um, this show aired nationally in Canada. Truly multi-talented, she's also appeared in various film and television series. In 2007, she returned to the United States and became the weather and traffic anchor in Atlanta at the CBS affiliate. Since 2011, she's been the weekday weather presenter for NBC7 San Diego. Dagmar has been living in Del Mar for the past eight years, has opened her home to a brood of dogs, chickens, bunnies, and other animal friends. And at this time, I'd like to present Dagmar Midcap to you. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, and hello, everyone. Um, coming fresh off the heels of uh, being uh, on the news just now, the four, five, six o'clock news, I had a little bit of a break to say hello and uh, maybe give you a little bit of information about climate change and then head right back, right back to it for the 11 o'clock news. Um, yeah, so let's see if we can get this done and let's see with the screen share. Sandra, I'm gonna to start to, to go to my desktop, see if I can load this now, get my screen going that I want to share with you. We will go to the very first slide. There's a bunch to go here. Uh, okay, so this is about as large. Sandra, you're seeing this. Is this about as large as I can make this screen? I'm gonna to try to go full screen on this. Uh, it is full screen, that is so interesting. Zoom in. It's about as zoomed in as this one will go, no matter how much I try to get away from those bars. Um, how are you feeling about that? That's a little too small of a slide. That's, that's the only other option I have, but that will mean, you know what, we'll try that. I think that might be a little bit of a better one. I'll try to scroll through that for you to the best of my ability. Um, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, every time I open with Google Slides, it um, does that. Fit screen, let's try it one more time, just real quick here, one more time again. Fit screen, 64%. Yeah, I think it's just gonna be too small if I go to- Yeah. Try, the only other thing you could try, right here, it says file, edit, and view, and help. Um, like, under, yeah. right under UCSD scripts, climate change. Then the, Sorry, no, I yeah, don't. I, where your cursor is, go to the left, move it to the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. Click that view and see if it gives you an option to present, like try present. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one. Ta-da! So I've not used Google Slides before. I'm used to stuff on my WSI. Hilton, you're the man. So yeah. this is, um, yeah, th so I've not, I'm used to my WSI computer, which is the system I use. So this was a brand new one for me. So yay, okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, so a couple things to take note of here, folks. So um, as a meteorologist, of course, this is very, very, very interesting to me, trying to find slides that can give you uh, all the information you need without boring you to tears with charts and graphs and lines and things like that, or giving you a cartoon of a person standing under a sun sweating, 
<laughs> so try to find the halfway point. There'll probably be one or two of each in here. So I, I do want to start with this one. This is an interesting one here. I'm going to try to focus on Southern California too, because when we talk about climate change, where do you begin? You know, do we begin with, of course, the air, the soil, the water, which continent, which hemisphere, the poles, the north, the south? So that would be like an 18-hour TED Talk. So we're going to just try to focus on Southern California for now, and that'll give you some idea as to what the rest of the world is facing. But really, the key words here, or the key word, will be extremes. So we're looking at weather extremes. Before we start to notice, in general, weather warm-up, which we already are, but we're looking at extremes. So this is a, just a bit of an interesting slide. These two numbers are to keep in mind over the next little while. That RCP basically is talking about greenhouse gas concentrations. So look at that little red line. If you can see my cursor here, but the very top, the red line is the, let's just imagine, that's the concentration of parts per million um, in, you know, what we're looking at, 800 and some odd parts per million, if not more, uh, um, of greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. So that would be the business as usual scenario. So imagine we don't do anything. We're not going to stop driving the cars we drive, the planes, whatever. We're going to continue with the fossil fuel burning. And you know, it, it just, again, business as usual. Then we have the 4.5 number. That's kind of the where we think we're going to level at because the green number at the bottom, that green line would be best case scenario if heaven were real. And so we're going to balance that out in between the 4.5. So between 8.5 and between green, we'll have 4.5. So going to next slide. It's not the next slide. That is the next slide. Okay, so here we go. Slide number two number three. So this is an interesting scenario here. So we'll come back to the 4.5 and the 8.5 one in a moment. So look at the global climate dashboard. I've tried to capture a few screenshots that just tell the story. Again, there's no way to tell the story in like a, a shorter TED talk. Look at the global climate average. What we're looking at here is just over the course of beginning in 1950, at the very top here, the very top row, that's the average global temperature. You'll have some that are a little under, as indicated by the blue lines, a little over is indicated by the red. But now watch going all the way up to the year 2010, my cursor at the bottom, 2015, and ending with 2020 right here at the end. That's where our global climate temperature averages have taken us over, 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 and consistently rising over. So we're no longer seeing those global climate averages under or a little over. Look at the carbon dioxide. Of course, you're familiar with, probably many of you are, with the Keeling curve. And that's thanks to Charles Keeling. His son, Ralph Keeling, works right here at the Scripps Institute, Institution of Oceanography. So he developed uh, a methodology to count the atmospheric parts per million of the carbon uh, molecules, the particles. And that's been consistently rising. He's measuring the northern hemisphere because we have more land. And so when the, in the winter months, the trees lose their leaves, we have a different measure of carbon dioxide because they absorb it than in the summer where we have the leaves and they are, they begin to absorb that uh, carbon dioxide. So the summer months you see carbon particles fall. In the winter months when the trees lose their leaves you see those levels rise. But overall the consistent trend once again, second slide, second uh, line here or chart, rise, 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 rise consistently. So have we been seeing parts per million or have we seen high parts per million of carbon um, dioxide before? Yes, we have, but this is a very different type. So you're dealing with different radioisotopes of carbon. So this one is coming from, as Ralph told me, the footprint, the fingerprint of human intervention. It's anthropogenic because it's coming from fossil fuel sources, not from decaying plants in this case, or volcanic explosions, is a different isotope, the C12, C13, C14. Those can tell you where that carbon came from. So we're seeing much more, if you were to take a particle, a particle or a parcel of air, much more of the, the C12 that comes, or the, the C, the carbon that comes from the human fossil fuel burning. So that's also how we know, yeah, the earth does warm and cool on its own, but this time it's kind of us. So looking at the spring snow melt, also the spring snow cover, watch what's happened here with that. This is interesting. 
So now you're seeing spring snow melting earlier. So in the, the northern hemispheres compared to the long term average, we have been seeing it melt now or not quite as frequently. It's been sticking around. Now we're seeing that melt sooner. So we're continuing to see the effects of that warming. And of course that affects us here because we're looking at uh, the Sierra. We'll get to that in a second too. Sea level rise, this is something interesting. Looking at the Arctic sea ice, this does affect us too, but I've, took, I've taken a few things globally, but just looking at some of these. Spring snow cover, look at some of this. The snow is melting much, much earlier now. And I, I, again, yeah, there we go, the bottom. So you're seeing that continuing to melt earlier. And what's happening also is the sea level rise. You're seeing it accelerate. It's just a few millimeters here and there, but it's adding up, it's adding up, it's adding up. And then that's continuing to just be a cycle for rising sea levels. But all these charts are going from 1950 through 2020. And you see it's consistent, it's steady, it's consistent. We're no longer seeing those sea, level, um, sea levels falling, it's just up, 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 up. So models, as they were generating this information 10, 20 years ago, it's showing up now. So the models on average have been correct. There are a few areas where not yet because there was no model agreement, but um, the more information, the more data we get, the more we're seeing that. Look at this also, the September Arctic sea ice. The area that's covered by sea ice in the Arctic at the end of the summer melt is now about 40% less on average at the end of every melt. So 40% more is melting every summer in the Arctic. You've heard of the, the record breaking temperatures we've been seeing in, in um, the permafrost regions just this summer. So since 1979, Look at the chart going down, 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 down. We're seeing 40% on average less sea ice that manages to survive all the way through the summer warming and melting months, which is of course, especially terribly news for all the animals that depend on that, the polar bear and, and um, you know, a lot of the sea life that, that requires that ice. So we're, we're seeing the sea melt, that's a pretty bad one. This is an interesting one. I'm gonna to try to go through this quickly. Average number of days above 114. This is just looking at Palm Springs from 2030 through 2050. <laughs> I'm not gonna go zoom in on that one, but you can see overall model data is indicating by the time we get to 2030, we'll see about an average of 14 days above 114 in Palm Springs. Heading in the wrong direction, of course. Looking at 2070 and beyond, we're looking at an average of about 24 days above 114 degrees Fahrenheit. So the long-term models continue to show us that we're gonna to start to feel this heat even more than we have over the last 50, 60, 70 years in Southern California. It's heading in that direction. Heading through, looking at 2030 in areas like Palm Spring, that's an area that's away from the coastal moderating effect of the, 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 the waters, the maritime effect. So we're looking at Palm Springs because it's kind of an isolated pocket of desert heat. Looking at the 2030 through 2050 mark, for on average now, you're seeing almost four times more the heat wave, the, the, the heat waves, which is generally means days that are about nine degrees warmer than the average. So whatever the average is, nine degrees warmer for a duration of four to five days. That's what kind of a heat wave is considered. So you're seeing that an average of four times more than you would have. And that's 2030 to 2050. That's not that far out. Seeing the same thing, double the heat wave duration. Heat waves are generally defined by, again, about nine degrees above temperature max, daytime high averages for duration of four to five days. We're now not just seeing the temperature itself rise and how many times we see a heat wave, but the duration of the heat wave. So all three factors now, how hot it will be, how long it will be hot, how many times we will see those heat waves, all of them increasing. And that's just, again, 2030 through 2050. It's about 10 years from now. So, oops, let me go to this one. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Remember that number I showed you, the 4.5 and the 8.5? 8.5, worst case scenario. 4.5 is probably the median. This is probably where we're gonna be. Again, looking at some of the temperature changes, you can expect to see those temperature changes here, worst case scenario, look at the temperatures at the bottom. Worst case, you would see on average temperatures 7, 8, 9, 10 degrees warmer than seasonal norms. Looking at the average, I don't know why that is above it, but looking at the average, we're going to see temperatures, let's say by 2040 or even by 
um, through 2039, we'll end up seeing mountains will start to warm up a little bit more, three, four, five degrees warmer. And looking at Julian, just ending up seeing what'll happen this Friday and Saturday, I've been here 10 years now, and more and more I begin to see numbers in Julian in the mid to the upper 90s. Not once, not twice a year, two, three times a year. So we're already starting to see that effect. Julian at elevation of 4,200 feet, seeing temperatures in the mid to the upper 90s. Those, the, the, the plants, the flora and fauna at those elevations, four to 6,000 feet, they're not made for those temperatures, but we're giving them those temperatures. Looking at temp days that will be above 95 days on average, this has kind of been where we're at now. So you end up seeing, you know, a few of those temperatures above again in through the deserts, of course, not a whole lot along the coast. Um, worst case, best case scenario, rather, you're looking at anywhere from one to five days added on to 95 and plus. Worst case scenario, five to 10 days above. So basically this is just showing you the long term is showing temperatures will continue to rise not just the amount of the temperature, but how many times throughout the course of the year will we see those temperatures change? This is a really interesting one. This is now looking at annual precipitation. Models on average are suggesting that in general, NorCal will see in the Four Corners region through Northern Nevada, will end up seeing wetter winters. Southern California, or, or annual precipitation, I should say, not even just spring and winter, but because we get most of our rain in spring and winter, that's where it would be noticeable. And that Southern California now is looking at potentially drier weather. So average scenario, worst case scenario. You're seeing drier weather in Southern California, wetter weather in Northern California. This would be the worst case scenario, that 8.5 number again. But now looking at the precipitation, some people look at that and think, oh good, well that'll be up in the Sierra range. I'm gonna get my skis and we're gonna go skiing. Nope. We're looking at also the precipitation factoring into rising temperatures. That means this is coming down as the liquid stuff, which means the all important snowpack is now, it looks like it will continue to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink, just like a lot of the world's glaciers are shrinking. We're looking at our Seattle, Sierra Nevada snowpack also shrinking. So this is coming down as the liquid stuff. And it's also interesting because it looks like it's coming from atmospheric rivers. Those have been around for a long time, but they've been just recently kind of identified and we're able to study them. So massive amounts of water vapor transport within the mid layers of the atmosphere. But they also bump into some of the higher mountain ranges, which is why those western facing slopes of the Sierra and in through the San Joaquin Valley, that's, or even here in San Diego County, the mountains kind of hold in that mid-level moisture transport, so it rains on those, those sides of the mountains. And you know, even to some extent, the leeward side ends up getting some rain. But that moisture transport is going to come down in areas, factor this in now too. We're also looking at drier summers. That means worse in terms of fire weather, overall fire conditions, more fires burning fires burning for longer because the summers are extended. Now you factor in that this rain is coming down from atmospheric rivers, which is torrential. It's coming down on recent burn scars as well. So all of that is a really bad mix. We want the snowpack. We need rain to fall in um, amounts so that the soil can absorb it. But we're gonna see the opposite, more burn scar, rain coming in the form of atmospheric rivers, a deluge of rain over three or four days coming down on recent burn scars, and very little in the summer months to carry us through from snowpack melt. So that's now what it's suggesting, that Northern California more rain, but Southern California less annual precipitation. That you know, also doesn't help us here. This is interesting, drier months, earlier summer onset. Now they take this specifically, March, April, and May months because that's kind of the end of winter and heading into the beginning of spring. What we'll see on average, again, yeah, average case here, this is what we're looking at, that 4.5 number is probably where we're gonna end up with the um, atmospheric content of greenhouse gases. Worst case scenario here, looking at shorter winters, less of a rainy season, a drier spring overall, and an earlier onset to summer months. That is even in the best case scenario, 
is going to end up leaving us with average precipitation, the MAM there, stands for March, April, May, average pre precipitation shift is under. You're in the negative values now when you're in those beiges. So by the time we get to, let's just say, not too far out here, 20, uh, first slide, 2006 through 2039, we're still seeing an average less. An average of, of precipitation is, sh is shrinking just in the next decade or so. We've already started to see that, although we have had a few extremes. I'll show you those in a minute. Those were interesting. More extremes, exactly. Remember the word when I said extremes? That's kind of what we're looking at. Extremes of rain, extremes of heat, extremes of fire, extremes of, of moisture. Except for the last two years, this has been odd. We haven't seen the moisture content from the monsoon patterns. So two years in a row now, we haven't seen that either. So what you'll see is, again, more extreme and heavy rain and drier periods with no rain, which is of course not gonna help us at all. So occasionally though, we do get those very wet days, but those very wet days are projected to become, even in that 4.5 ratio right there, the average where we're probably gonna end up, five to 20% more of those wet days. That's the, the uh, atmospheric transport of the atmospheric river. So those are the ones we're going to start to see more of and they'll linger for a longer amount of time and potentially bring more rain to us in a shorter amount of time. So that's also where we're headed. That doesn't mean we'll get the right amount of rainfall over the course of the year, the annual precipitation, it means they're gonna be jammed up into extreme events. Again, not where we wanna go, we need balance. We're heading away from that balance. So slide 14. And this is interesting too, the hourly sea level projected for La Jolla. So just La Jolla. Looking at, by the year 2050, we're looking at just a few peaks, little dots of red, which are just a little bit of average rise above sea level. Now you're looking at 2075. I know this is a long ways out, but this is where we're headed and the models are in pretty good agreement on this. We're looking at almost daily, every day, by the time you get to 20, 2100, it's a long ways out for sure, but for us, you're looking at every single day will be well above sea level rise, well above that. So the shoreline that you see here and know and love today, that'll be gone. And that's not, that isn't by geological standards, that's not that far out. Now we'll go to the Santa Ana winds. And this is interesting because we're seeing extremes and models are still trying to figure out what will and what will not happen because this is new. This, this type of global warming hasn't occurred in Earth's geologic history. The anthrop anthropogenic effect is brand new. So models struggle with that. So Santa Ana winds, will we see more or less? It's possible we might actually see a few less because Santa Ana winds are born when there is an outbreak of cold air that settles in over the Four Corners region. And that cold air has to go someplace. It has to drain. So it floods around. I'll show you here, this next one. It floods around right there. Surface high pressure, colder air settles in there. And it ends up having to go someplace. So it goes to the lowest area it can, sea level. Ends up pushing through Southern California. The lowest pressure would be at the coast, the lowest sea level. So the less we see cold air outbreaks, it looks like possibly Santa Ana wind, Santa Ana wind event may become less common and also weaker in time. That's maybe, that's because we might not have that cold air sitting in over that Four Corners region to give us that pressure gradient of high pressure versus low pressure. So there's a little bit of some good news, possibly with the Santa Anas. So in general, oopsies, slide where was I? 17 in general so looking at california southern california the baja peninsula definitely changing because we are seeing an anthropogenic effect in there and it's not a minute effect on on average the scientific community is is in agreement that it's at, at least 60 to 80 percent of the push that we're currently seeing because of the fact that there's so much pollution and the, the new chemicals we're adding to the air, the soil, the water, that, those are the primary drivers of climate. We're just altering them from a chemical composition standpoint day and night. So one of the things that scientists are most certain about, water temperature, changing warming water temperatures. We'll not just see rising sea levels, but warming temperatures. And when, um, when water warms, it expands. That also adds a little bit to sea level rise. So what we'll see is again, wet and dry spells from months 
and decades, and the water supply will be an issue for us here in Southern California because we get most of ours from Colorado or from the Sierra snowpack. So that's gonna be a big issue for Southern California. Extremes, extreme heat waves, extreme drought, higher sea level events, coastal flooding, exacerbated by climate change. So again, the middle of the road projection for sea level rise, that 4.5 number you saw, it's about three feet by 2100 but it may actually be higher, but they're being very conservative with about three feet. So we see a number of changes across the land, across the air, the soil, and the water. And those are all tying in together because the soil depends on the water. The water, I mean, the, um, the oceans, the oceans depend on the air. So they're, of course, all tied in together. Slide 17, sorry, I'm talking fast. This is an interesting one. It's a little hard to see, but just looking at some of the trends here, the latest number at the very bottom is 2020. And this is showing in, in the amount of money, the billions that we're ending up seeing it costing us. So it used to cost us, cost you know the amount of money that would cost to repair something in 1964 due to a wildfire or drought or a tropical cyclone. That's gone, that's gone up from about 350 million to 350 billion, 400 billion, 450 billion. So we're seeing the cost, of course, from all disasters combined, but drought, separate that to flooding, separate that to extreme storm events. The cost in dollars is also rising. So that's a big issue. By month, severe weather. This is interesting too. Uh, we're ending up seeing the disasters in, of course, here with tropical cyclone months being from April through May through June, July, August, September, because we get more of the droughts, we get some Santa Anas, we get the wildfires mixed in there. So our summer months are bringing us in Southern California more of those extremes here. So we go from tropical rain, burn scars, to wildfires, more burn scars, more rain, uh, not helping the landscape. So we're seeing a lot of that in the middle of the year. You know what, that's just more numbers, but basically showing the drought, the numbers that add up to that. Okay, this is something interesting. The drought, the, these extremes that we're seeing just over the last two years, one year to the next. In 2017 through 2018, we had 3.34 inches at San Diego at Lindbergh Field measured for precipitation. These are some of the images from San Diego County from that year, drought, 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 drought. 2018 through 2019, 12.93 inches, 13 inches more images from San Diego after those rains. So just one year to the next, you saw an average of, or not an average, you saw 3.34 inches to 12.93 inches. That was a massive change and a massive difference in the water that we didn't end up, the precipitable water that we did end up being able to measure in, in terms of rain. Huge changes, those are the extremes we're talking about. Southern California weather impacts from about 2015 to 2020, some of you may remember this, Warmest 12, that, that major drought that we had, especially in through the Sierra range, 12, 12, 2012 through 2016, warmest and driest for California, record. 2017 and 18, second driest year on record. 2018 was the hottest summer ever on record. 2014 through 15 were the hottest years on record as well. So we're seeing hottest years keep adding on to more and more and more. So we're seeing also some of the wettest days, February 2019, you remember that just last year? We set a record on Idlewild Mountain. We set records for damaging winds. We set records for the second wettest season ever recorded in 2019 in California. The highest the San Diego River was ever recorded at, or the third highest, it was at 14 feet. So these have all happened in the last year or two. So we're seeing again, Extreme, 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 extreme. 2000, 2018, just another example of where we saw the holy fire from at that burn scar. You remember people surfing through the streets, San Diego River flooding, some of the amounts of rainfall that we would see in just two hours. For San Diego, Oceanside and Costa Mesa registered two hours of rain, uh, two inches of rain in two hours. Atmospheric River, here's another one. We're going to be seeing more of these. Damaging high winds do come along with them. That's not usually um, a characteristic of an atmospheric river, but it definitely does happen. And the snow levels rise because atmospheric rivers are very warm. So you would hope that we would get some snowpack being built up when these come through in February. Nope, because it's a warm subtropical event in nature, all it does is just add more rain to the Sierra and that creates a lot more flood runoff. That's not what we wanted to see. So 
those atmospheric river events look like they will be more prevalent. And you know, look at some of the flooding, the damage created. February 14th, Valentine's Day, just last year. I don't know if you remember some of these, just here in San Diego County. Massive road damage, floods, mudslides. So for 2019 to 2020 this year, we had a very, very uh, wet start. It was a dry middle year. And it was a, a, a fairly good water year. The water year goes from October 1st through September 30th. But it doesn't actually look great we had a good start. It doesn't look great, though, as we do head through the rest of this year. Um, the middle of the year looks like we'll end up being too dry. And then maybe as we end up going through the end of this year, we'll, we'll make it up just a little bit. So again, we, we had a very wet start to the year. But from now, so from October 1st through January 1st, again, look at this. This is just a quick note. See the purple? The purple means we were at 300% two to 300% above normal for rainfall. This whole area, the desert Southwest, two to 300% above normal. Now, looking again at that precipitation across the country, see where we did end up seeing two to 300% across that sunbelt zone, because we had a lot of subtropical events come sliding through. There's one more slide in there. I think it might actually be it. Well, let me escape out of this one. I think that is the last one. Um, so that was just to, yeah. So that was just to kind of give you an idea of where we're headed with climate change. Just to try to focus in on Southern California, and there's so much to talk about there. Extremes will be the norm, which at that point isn't an extreme anymore. <laughs> but before we get to the norm, that's what we'll continue to see more rain coming down in a shorter amount of time, less snow falling in the Sierra range. That's the central and northern California region. When we get heavy rainfall in San Diego, that will end up giving us the flooding down here. But on average, looks like San Diego County will see five to 10% less annual precipitation. So we're heading for drier winters, drier summers. Also earlier onset of summers, it's a big issue with fuel load. Some good news, Santa Ana's may weaken, the events may become uh, fewer in nature and also weaker on average. Del Mar in specific is a very protected little zone and it's gonna be really hard to determine exactly how that will affect Del Mar because we're moderated by the sea breeze and it's just a wonderful place to live. We're high above any potential coastal flooding. So you're actually one of the safest places here, one of the last places to notice climate change. But uh, even in terms of the water, the resources, again, we buy about 80% of our water. It comes from outside the county. So that'll hit us here as well. Um, there was a lot to talk about there. Gosh, I hope that wasn't, I'm gonna go, you are stop screen sharing, so I'll go back. I hope that wasn't horribly too much talking and too much information. It was just kind of a snapshot of what we've seen, where we think we're headed and how that will affect San Diego County. So um, I hope that was at the very least somewhat interesting to you. I find it fascinating. <laughs> it was super fascinating. Thank you so much. You actually have a question from Garrett. Oh, hi, um, Garrett. Considering the effect of trees to filter CO2, would you think it is more impactful to reduce, prevent deforestation or reduce unnecessary CO2 production? I think that's probably going to, oh, that's a difficult one because when we're talking about uh, deforestation, we're also talking about the loss of, I think, I. Oh, it's going to be both. But really, if you had to pick one or the other, which I don't think we should do, it would be deforestation. Because when we're talking about deforestation, we're talking about places like the Amazon. We're talking about biodiversity zones. So it's not just referring to, you know, a crop of trees that we planted for the sake of sequestering carbon, which also you have to remember those leaves only sequester it for a short amount of time, and then it's re-released back into the atmosphere. So, God, it's actually twofold. Reducing that fossil fuel use and dependency is a massive issue. But what we also have to do in the short term, we must maintain the biodiversity because what you're seeing outside right now is the more that 8 billion humans come in contact with individual pockets of biodiversity, the more we do come in contact with various new bacteria, various new viruses. Those are all going to impact us. And we must maintain the health 
of those individual biodiverse zones. So I would say, you know, keep, keep, keep the Amazon where it is. Cutting down those biodiverse zones is going to impact us more directly in the short term, but in the long term, we have to focus on reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and the fossil fuel dependency. Because again, um, trees only sequester carbon for a short amount of time. It's re-released at some point. That's the whole decay process. So that means we also have to reduce the output. But in the short time, let's not continue to slush and burn the Amazon. That's a bad idea. That is true. Um, Steve wanted you to know that your presentation was fascinating but depressing. Um. Oh, I know. <laughs> I thank you. I know. There's not. I mean, this is what's happening, though. But the more we have an awareness of this, the more we can make a change. Every single one of us makes a little addition to that every day, and every single one of us can make a little less of an of an addition every day. So. Um, it's just being mindful of it that makes the difference. I was able to interview Jane Goodall last year and she always talks about, I don't want you to think globally because that's overwhelming. She said, I want you to think locally. That little plastic straw you were gonna use, don't use that. Let's not shove that up a sea turtle's nose. Let's do, let's just little things you make changes with every day add up. And that's, I think that's something positive. So thank you, Steve. <laughs> Actually, that I, I love locally, not globally. Um, yeah. You have a question from Carol. Um, any idea of ocean storms and wave surges will become more frequent? Yes, what we're seeing is as water temperatures rise, um, you have to have, I believe it's a, a water temperature of 80 degrees and then some in the Atlantic sea basin for tropical cyclones or even um, um, extra tropical cyclones to exist in the Atlantic basin. They have to have a sea surface temperature Hurricanes have to have that of 80 degrees. If they don't have that, the, the heat cycle doesn't survive. It breaks apart. The cyclone loses its energy. So the warmer the sea surface temperatures are, the more the, poten the, more the food exists for that hurricane to survive on. The more food that hurricane has, the stronger it will become. The more you will see the uh, Cat 3, Cat 4, Hurricanes, Cat 5, the more you will end up seeing the extreme hurricanes that will create the storm surge. So yes, we're creating warmer oceans, which is where more powerful tropical and subtropical cyclones live. They need that food source and we're giving it to them. Sorry, that was depressing too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, oh, you have a question to ask for what an, to, bleh, to ask for an explanation on what an atmospheric river is. Oh, so this is really interesting. Gosh, let me see here. If I'm going to go back to, let me do this real quick and see if I can't find this for you. Desktop. Come on, come on, come on. Desktop. Okay, so here we go. So let me see. Are you seeing this? Yes. Images. So just to show you, and this is a really interesting one. Let me see where they exist. Uh, share screen again. Oh, hit, hit share screen again. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Going out, going back to, bummer. Where is, now I can't find it. Uh, oh, no, where are you? Where's uh, Zoom? I think I, I thought I hit share screen, but now I can't find it. Anyway, um, can you see me or not? We see you. I see. Uh, yeah. Average. So I can't find uh, the screen share on that. It would be, if you have the Zoom screen open, it's at the bottom. Uh, there it is. There it is. Found it. Okay. Now I thought I hit it and then I went to desktop. Sure. I'm sharing the screen, but for some reason it's not taking it. Mm, okay. Yeah. It's not, doesn't seem to take it. So, and there, and there's no way. So this you're not seeing, right? You're not seeing any of this right now? No. Summer. So let's go back to Zoom at the bottom. Uh, okay. I'm not fond of this overall. Oh, I wish I could show you this. Atmospheric river. Um, okay. So let's just try to tell you because, please. okay, post attendee. Yeah, it's the, the Zoom screen just kind of isn't at this point but 
my view history. Whatever. If you can see me, the, the, I'll just try to explain it. An atmospheric river, it, it basically, it's a lot of moisture transport. At any given point, uh, am I still on? I hope so. Yes. You're still on. Okay. At any, so while I'm talking, I'll try to find this still. At any given point in time, within the atmosphere, coming from the subtropical regions, that's where you end up from the subtropics and from the, the tropical areas and the equator zones, you will see fingers of moisture transport going to the Southern hemisphere, going to the Northern hemisphere. And you see those around the globe at any given point in time. And those are just natural moisture transport systems where they come from the moisture rich warm areas of the tropics. And they, they kind of snake their way up into the polar regions where they cool and they fall as precipitation. So those atmospheric rivers are large areas of mostly mid-level, low-level atmospheric rain transport, moisture transport. So they're within the, for the bottom few thousand feet of the atmosphere. They're not high up. They're not in the jet stream. They can be guided by the jet stream, which is, you know, depending on where you are in the earth, 30,000 feet up, 15 to 30,000 feet. But the, the moisture transport is very low level. And there's depending on the strength of one of those rivers, that can be aligned from a subtropical and a tropical region like the Hawaiian Islands and direct itself squarely up to the north and northeast and towards Southern California. And all of that moisture that's coming in the form of this, this, this cloud cover that's snaking along, it really looks like a river, that's all gonna end up falling in Southern California or in Central California because it's a very low transport, just a few thousand feet up. So it gets stuck on the mountains. The mountains hold it in place and all those clouds come up against the mountains and they get smashed up against those higher elevation zones. And the rain all comes down on that side. That's where you end up getting all that coastal flooding, which is why a lot of times when we have the atmospheric rivers up in San Bernardino and the San Gabriel range, they're eight, nine, 10,000 feet up. They get hit way harder with mudslides and flooding than we do down here. Some of the clouds do manage to get over the San Diego County mountains, and they do give some precipitation and some rain to the deserts, which is great. But uh, that's what the atmospheric river is again a low level, mid level moisture transport that originates in the tropics and it just kind of floats along in the atmosphere until it bumps into something. And then again, it's just forced to stay in place, and the rain says, All right, fine, I'll fall here then. And it does. I actually was, when, when you were giving your presentation, I Googled atmospheric rivers and it said that in California, there's a billion dollars worth of damages a yeah. year. And most of it's in Sonoma County. Yeah, because we're seeing the higher elevation ranges of the Sierra Nevada hemming that in. That's where they're getting stuck again. So the atmospheric rivers, one of the biggest events was way back, I, that the, it, it, it also does more damage because now we have so much of the land that could absorb soil is covered with roads and pavement and there's no ability for the for the land to absorb what we've paved over so that's where you also end up getting a whole lot more flooding because we're channeling this water away from the zones where it can't be absorbed like street like uh, streets and highways and parking lots so you're ending up seeing also we're changing the nature of the ground the ability to absorb that rain so we're we're um we're kind of forcing it into areas where we will see uh, more damage being done than if the rain were allowed to be absorbed over a broader area. That makes okay. sense. Yeah, no, it does. I actually just gave a call for last questions. Uh -huh. And if I don't get another question in the chat, then I think we'll um, wrap it up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, thank you for joining us and thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. Oh, yeah. good. Yes, yes. I think I just figured out the screen oh, share. Well, well, we'll do that really quick. Did you do the, can you see this one? Definitely. Okay, La leave it here. This is what I was looking for. That, those are atmospheric rivers. In the subtropical regions, the reds and the yellows and the oranges are where you see the highest amount of rainfall. All of that is heavy precipitation. So the tropics, every single one of these little fingers, see that one, that is coming from the Hawaiian Island region, bam, right up in through 
Central California. That's a strong atmospheric river. There's another one. We have them in the Southern Hemisphere as well. At any given time on Earth, you see fingers of moisture reaching out from the subtropics and tropics into uh, the temperate zones. That right there is a prime example of an atmospheric river with another one waiting right in behind it. And we have one in the Atlantic Basin. That's what those are. So just streams, fingers of moisture content low level moisture content being directed right at Southern California, central and Southern. That's fascinating. Now we're all going to go off and do research just on atmospheric rivers. Uh, yeah, well, they're, 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 they've been around for a long time, but nobody really knew what they were, but because now with the global, global satellite information, we were learning so much more about them. We couldn't see this 100 years ago or 50 years ago, now we can. Well, I also, I also felt um, very relieved when you mentioned how protected Del Mar is. So we all made good choices by uh, settling in Del Mar. You did, you did. <laughs> you did too. Well, yes. We're, we're going to wrap up tonight. I wanted to thank you again and um, thank everyone for joining us. And uh, we're going we're gonna to end the meeting at this time. Thank you. I hope I didn't talk too much. I know I talk a lot and I talk fast. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, have a good evening. See you on the 11th. Bye.